and places them into Christ. At the moment of salvation, we are baptized into Christ, as it says in 1 Corinthians 12, 12, and 13. So we're going to begin by looking at some of these passages that help us understand this more clearly. And I'll just summarize what we looked at the last time. We saw that Peter's condition was an obstacle to Jesus building his church. Peter was one with Satan in thwarting God's purpose of Jesus going to the cross. Jesus, as our forerunner and example, was the true disciple, as we see in Isaiah chapter 50, verse 4. He was the true disciple of the Father, who denied his own soul life. When he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, Father, if it be possible, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And so we see that Jesus, in his humanity, his perfect humanity, as the last Adam, he had a will. We know that when he came into this world, he was sinless. But he still had a soul life. In fact, when he was on the cross, we know from Isaiah chapter 53, he poured out his soul unto death. And he gave his soul, as we see in, I think it's Mark 10 and Matthew 20, in exchange for the human race. His soul was that which was given up in death on the cross. So we are to follow him daily in obedience. He was obedient unto death, and we are to follow him in the same way as we see in Matthew 16, 24 through 26, Luke 14, 25 and following. We are to deny our, our soul life. And in order for us to understand this, we have to look at the cross, not only as the place where Jesus Christ died for our sins as our substitute, but where Jesus Christ as the last Adam and as our representative was identified with the fallen race in Adam. He had no inherent sin, but as the last Adam, he summed up all that that represents the human race in Adam. And in that act of crucifixion, the entire Adamic race was crucified and died. That's the revelation of the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul. In Romans 6, and Galatians 2.20, we see in Colossians 2.11 and following, is that the cross is so momentous in its work. As I said, it not only deals with the substitutionary work of Christ, but representatively, we, in terms of our inheritance, in terms of our identity in Adam, we, as Christians, are identified with him in his death. Now, that takes place positionally when we are born again, but the outworking of that, the progressive outworking of our lives coming into conformity with his death in order that we might be brought progressively more in conformity with him and his resurrection is the whole work and ministry of the Holy Spirit of conforming us to the image of Christ. We see Paul's aspiration in Philippians 3, 8 to 10, that his desire was to gain Christ. And how do you gain Christ? He might know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings by being conformed unto his death. Now, Paul clearly understood that in Christ, that he as a believer and we as believers died when he died on the cross. Our life was terminated. We see that in Romans chapter 6, verse 6, that our old man, the old man, that's our identity in Adam, was co-crucified with Christ on that cross, that the body of sin might be rendered powerless. So we see that, but it's the experiential outworking that we need to better understand and hopefully that this will help some in understanding God's dealings with us because God has to deal with our soul life, our natural life. Hebrews 4.12, there has to be that process where there's the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and the soul being our mind, emotion, will. This is how we relate to time and space. But our human spirit, which we see is begotten, Hebrews chapter 12, the father is the father of our spirits And as we are disciplined, that is, we are trained and educated by the Father, we become more and more a partaker of the life of Jesus Christ. And so the only way we could understand this from the standpoint of a biblical precedent is the Church at Corinth. The Church at Corinth was, unfortunately, the most carnal of any of the churches that Paul planted or Jesus Christ built. We're looking at that, which represents Jesus Christ building his church. So if we follow the life of the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts, chapter 18 when he came to Corinth he was there 18 months at Corinth and if we look at the fruit of him being there 18 months and we see the conditions that he had to address probably 5 years later in 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians the circumstances were very discouraging they were very demoralizing to Paul and of course 18 months is a long time you contrast Paul's missionary work in establishing the church of Corinth with that of the Thessalonians he was only a Thessalonian for three weeks. Three weeks. And yet when you read First Thessalonians, 
And we see the difference in the way the Thessalonian believers responded to that of the Corinthians. There is a vast difference. We see that the church at Thessalonica, that they were a model church, an example to all the churches in their region throughout northern and southern Greece. And Paul commends them for that. They are suffering for their stand for Christ, and he wants to encourage them. And they're just, they're a baby church. And so the contrast between the church of Thessalonica and the church of Corinth is absolutely drastic. And so we have the same thing on earth today. We have different churches and believers in different spiritual states that would either be characterized by those who are an example to other churches, like we see the Thessalonians, as we see the church of Philadelphia in Revelation chapter 3, in contradistinction to Pergamum, Thyatira, or Laodicea, or Corinth. And so what is the difference? If we look at 1 Corinthians, we'll just notice some of the essential characteristics of believers in the church at Corinth and what the problem was that was causing the division. I'll just pick up in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, where Paul says, I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you allow yourselves to be adjusted, to be mended, to be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. For I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. Now I mean this, that each one of you is saying, I am of Paul. That is, there were those in Corinth that were aligning themselves with Paul as the founder and teacher of the saints of Corinth. He says, I am of Apollos. And of course, Apollos was a very intellectual individual, very powerful in the scripture. And another group is saying, I am of Cephas. And another group says, I am of Christ. So we see there's four different groups. And the I am of Christ, they're denying any human authority, and they're super spiritual, so they think they're just as much part of the problem as the others who are aligning themselves with different leaders. And we have the same thing today. It is a characteristic of spiritual immaturity, spiritual babes in Christ. And so he says, has Christ been divided, that is, parceled out and distributed among you? Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? And then he said he did not come to baptize. And so we see that the division in the church of Corinth was the alignment of different people with different teachers who God had used to help establish them in the faith. And when we turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1, we see how he characterizes their spiritual condition. This is in 1 Corinthians 3, 1. I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as babes in Christ. What a contrast between the church of Corinth and the church of Thessalonica. He says, I gave you milk to drink and not solid food, for you were not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now you are not yet able, for you are still fleshly. That means you're still governed by that old Adamic nature. And we're going to see that with reference to the Corinthians, it wasn't just the carnal fleshly condition we see in 1 Corinthians 5, where a man is sleeping with his father's wife. I mean, that's obviously carnal. But before Paul ever deals with that kind of fleshly carnality, he's going to address that which is the intellect. It is the wisdom of this world, the wisdom of this age, that was dominating the so-called spirituality of the Corinthians. In other words, the divisions can be traced back to their still being attached in some way to intellectually, also even emotionally, to their old pagan Greek way of thinking. And so we see that they're in a very serious condition. So if we go back to the first chapter, we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, the solution to the problem at Corinth is not the blood of Jesus, because he addresses them as brethren, chapter 1, verse 10. He addresses them as saints, chapter 1, verse 2. They're called into fellowship of God's Son, verse 9. So they are truly believers. So what is God's solution to the divisions that are there among the believers of Corinth? It is the message of the cross. Not the cross for salvation, but the cross for sanctification. So the Apostle Paul mentions in chapter 1, verse 18, For the word, or the message of the cross, is to those who are perishing foolishness, but to us who are present tense being saved, that is, the progressive work of sanctification, this cross is the power of God. And it is that statement that what I have seen is that the church, unfortunately, is very ignorant of. How is the cross the power of God in the life of a Christian, in the life of a local assembly? How does that work out? 
Well, we're just going to follow through some of these verses and just get a broad stroke, if you will, of an overview of how this has this out working. He says, It is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe, that is, the Jewish expert in the scriptures? Where is the debater of this age? That, for the Greek, would be the super intellectual person that could win a debate. Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs, and Greeks search for wisdom. And I'll just stop right there. The church at Corinth was primarily a Gentile church, and therefore their search for wisdom was that which characterized them. But what kind of wisdom? We see in, in the passage that they were governed by the wisdom of men, chapter 2, verse 4, or the wisdom of this world, we see in chapter 1, verse 20. It was the wisdom of this age, chapter 3, verse 18, or the wisdom of this world, again mentioned in chapter 3, verse 19. So this is the problem with the believers at Corinth. They don't understand this. In fact, they actually believe that they are more spiritual than the Apostle Paul, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. In their mind, when you read that, and then, of course, chapter 4, if you read on, they were actually judging Paul, who was out in the arena fighting immense spiritual battles for God's interest in the church. They were sitting in the grandstand, as it were, as if they were already ruling and reigning with Christ. And they were there as his judge while he's in the arena doing battle. And so it is quite an irony to see the way in which Paul, as a spiritual father, seeks to bring these believers into alignment with God's purpose. But it's very difficult, as I say to those who are listening, it's very difficult for people to understand God's strategy to divide asunder, Hebrews 4.12, the soul from the spirit. For the Corinthians, we see that they are occupied with a fleshly wisdom of this world. And therefore, they would look at Paul, and they said, well, I'm of Paul, or I'm of Apollos, or I'm of Cephas. That is a fleshly distinction. Because Paul goes on to say, with reference to the ministry of these different ones, in chapter 3, verse 4, he says, When one says, I am of Paul, and another I am of Apollos, are you not mere men? In other words, they were acting as unbelievers. And it's no different than Peter's state. Peter was very sincere. It wasn't that he was operating out from his sin nature. He was operating out of his emotions and out of his intellect. He was not a crucified man. And so Paul goes on to say, verse 5, What then is Apollos? What then is Paul? Servants to whom you believe, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but God who causes the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor, for we are God's fellow workers and you are God's field and God's building. And so I want us to be able to see God's solution that is presented by Paul to this predominantly carnal and fleshly church at Corinth. So we're going to go back to chapter 2, verse 1. And notice how Paul as an example, and as a spiritual father, which he was, to them. He says, And when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, when you look at that, why didn't he say, you just need to have a better understanding of the blood of Jesus? You know, the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from all sin. He didn't say that. Because they already understood that. They already understood that the death of Christ saved them from the penalty of sin. They were clear on that. But what they didn't understand is that in that cross, who they are as Greek wise men, or as those who profess to be wise in this age, they were operating out of a fleshly wisdom. and Therefore, they were not able to receive the things of God. They had a limitation. As Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1-4. through 4. And this is so much the problem in the church. When you teach, I remember when I was in Singapore, I spoke to a very large assembly there of about 1,500 people. It was a very strong, charismatic church, and they had a lot of music in the beginning. And some of it was so loud, I wish I'd had earplugs. But they had a desire for the things of the Lord. But when it comes to certain aspects of the message of God, there was no place for it to go. There was just no capacity. Because a lot of that which represents their spiritual life was coming out from the soul. 
and there were certainly some that had a real desire. We were able to have fellowship in a certain measure. But when it comes to that which represents the full counsel of God, as Paul refers to in Acts chapter 20, there was very little place for this to go. And so this is very tragic. And so you can have on one side that which represents the charismatic and the emphasizing certain experiences, which would be the solical aspect of the emotions, but on the other side, you can have those who are literalist or the Bible church movement who claim to have all this knowledge of God's word, but are still just as divisive as those who are clinging to their form of spirituality that I would consider hyper charismatic. So you can have on both sides and still be operating out of a soul dominated kind of Christianity. And so Paul is dealing with both. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12 to 14, Paul has to address the emotional side of their spirituality, which was setting aside the word of God for a form of glossolalia that was not even characterized by that which represents unity and the priority of prophecy that is speaking forth the word of God. The whole emphasis shifted, and so he very gently as a father sought to correct them and bring them back into alignment. But in the first part of the book of Corinthians, we see that their soul life was dominated by a fleshly wisdom. So he says, I determined to know nothing among you, 1 Corinthians 2, 2, except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So why did he use that word crucified? Because on the cross, according to Romans chapter 6, Colossians 2, 11 and following, that on that cross, Jesus Christ took the entire Adamic race with him into death. That's Romans 5, 12 and following. We see the contrast between the first and the last Adam. And what a study that is. What a contrast between the two Adams. And so he says, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, would he want to take them beyond that? Yes, but you find nothing in the book of Corinthians that matches the spiritual life and the revelation that we see in Ephesians. There was no place for it to go because they were governed by, as we're going to see, the natural man. He says, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my message and preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, that is, the wisdom of this world, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power. And we see in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, that the spiritual power came through Paul in and through his weakness. And that's completely contrary to the Greek mindset, to have strong natural intellect, strong natural physique. This was the mindset of the carnal or natural man in the Greek mind. And so Paul didn't line up with that. In fact, he was considered someone to be despised. And he wasn't even considered an apostle, as we see in Second Corinthians chapter 10 through 13. He had to defend his apostolic ministry that was being subverted by certain ones that had infiltrated the church at Corinth. And so it is a real battle. I mean, this battle for our spiritual life is not only threatened by principalities and powers, by that which represents the occult, false doctrine. That's all addressed in the Word of God. But here at Corinth, it wasn't false doctrine. It was uncrucified, natural soul life dominated by the wisdom of man. And that's what he addresses in verse 5. He says, yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature. Now, it's important, again, when you look at that phrase mature and compare what Paul said later in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1-3, to they were not mature. He makes it very clear they were not mature. But he says, we do speak wisdom to those who are mature, a wisdom, however, of this age, nor the rulers of this age who are passing away. But we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom of God, which he predestined before the ages to our glory. So there is a wisdom that he would have liked to proclaim to the Corinthians, but they were ensnared in the wisdom of man, verse 4, and chapter 1, verse 20, the wisdom of this world. And he again mentions the same phraseology in 1 Corinthians 3, 18 and 19. And I'm giving these verses so when people study, they can see for themselves that the conditions that he is addressing there is representative of much of what we see in Christendom today. That is, at the very root of that which represents divisions. We're not talking about divisions because of heresies or false doctrine, but we're talking about divisions because of a natural, uncrucified soul life. And we see the same thing with Peter. Peter was sincere. He was uncrucified in terms of his natural man. And so what does Paul do? He brings in the message of the cross. He goes on to say that there is a wisdom for the mature. Verse 8, he says, The wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood, for had they understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But just as it is written, Paul says, 
things which eye has not seen or ear has not heard. This means there is a wisdom that is greater than the natural mind of the Greek intellect, the natural soul life. The wisdom of man will never touch this. There is a wisdom which eye has not seen or ear has not heard, which have not entered the heart of man, that God has prepared for those who love him. Now, that's not in eternity. Notice verse 10. For to us God has revealed them through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. So now Paul is making it very clear that there is a wisdom, but it's not going to have its source in the intellect of the natural man, the soul governed man, but it's going to come from the Spirit of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of man except the Spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the Spirit of God. So God has thoughts, and the only way we can relate to God is in our human spirits, in terms of that which is spiritual or that which is mature. Until the soul life has received blow after blow after blow, till our natural man is reduced to the brokenness and brought into a place of humility so that the human spirit can more and more come into a place of ascendancy, as we see in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, the whole spirit, soul, and body in that order. Instead of body, soul, and spirit, when we're born again, it's body, soul, and spirit. That's our condition. But God's discipline of us and his training of us and his educating us is to bring about a reversal of our natural Adamic state and condition from the soul being in a place of ascendancy to the human spirit. And this is a process of growth. And so we see Paul goes on to say, we have not received the spirit of the world, verse 12 of 1 Corinthians 2, but the spirit who is from God that we might know the things freely given in grace to us by God. That freely given means in grace, graciously given. And here is, uh, I have to be somewhat technical here, because in the original, the morphology, that is the form of some of these words, can either be neuter or masculine. And so I'm going to have to explain that so that when some of you who are reading and following in some of your translations, you're going to see the distinctions, and I'm going to explain why there's these distinctions. And some of your Bibles have a margin that will give you an alternative reading, and I will explain that to you. So Paul talks about, there is that which is freely given to us by the Spirit of God, verse 13, which things we speak, also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit. And then some of your translations, and I have a New American Standard here, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. Now, in the Greek, the form of that can either be neuter or masculine. So, in this particular translation, they translate the word pneumatikos, the word spiritual, as neuter. But the morphology of the form can also be masculine. So, how do we know how to translate it? The context must determine which choice the translator makes. And so, since the contrast is between that which is spiritual, verse 13, between that which is solical or natural, verse 14, we know that we should interpret verse 13 not in the neuter, but in the masculine. So, if we translate these terms spiritual in terms of the masculine, it would go like this. Which things we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but those taught by the Spirit, combining that is interpreting spiritual things, spiritual phenomenon, not in the neuter, to spiritual men, spiritual people. But see, they're not spiritual, chapter 3, verse 1. I could not speak to you as spiritual men. You see that, First Corinthians 3, 1? So the issue is that they're not in sync with the Holy Spirit. They're not in sync with one another, and they're not in sync with the Holy Spirit. They're not even in sync with their human spirit, verse 11, that is to be under the government of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because they don't understand that aspect of the cross where they died. And so there is a wisdom where the Spirit interprets spiritual things, that is, spiritual phenomenon, with or to those who are spiritual people. Now, the word spiritual is pneumaticos, that is, those who are governed and characterized by the Spirit. Not only the Holy Spirit, but of the human spirit. The Holy Spirit, in union with the human spirit, that means a spiritual person, that is in a place of ascendancy, and the soul, through the work of the cross, has brought those believers into a place of submission to God, so that the mind, emotion, will are a servant to the Spirit, not a ruler. But the natural, that word natural is the word that is the opposite of spiritual. Spiritual is pneumaticos, the word natural is psukikos. The word suke is the word for 
supernatural man refers to the person whose life is governed by the soul. And this is the characteristic state of the Corinthians, who say Paul is referring to unbelievers. Well, yes, the unbeliever who is unregenerate is wholly natural. And that's the whole point in chapter 3 and verse 4. In chapter 3, verse 4, he says, Are you not acting like mere men? So they were acting like mere men as the unregenerate in their assembly life. And so he goes on to say, But the natural, that is the natural man, that which is governed by the life of the soul and characterized by the life of the soul, sukikos, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. And this is exactly the condition and state of the Corinthians in their relationship to the Apostle Paul. They were not in a place where they could receive the deeper things of God that Paul had for them. He says, when the natural man hears spiritual things, they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned, they are spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritual, whose life is not dominated by the life of the soul, the natural man, but governed by the life of the spirit, he appraises, that is, he critically examines and appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised or judged and discerned by no man. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he should instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ? Now, who are the we? The we are not the Corinthians. The we refers to Paul and those who had taught them. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual man, chapter 3, verse 1. So where does that leave us in terms of assessing the problem that was facing and challenging the Apostle Paul with reference to this church that he had spent 18 months, and now they're floundering. It's a tragedy, and we see so much of that that has come into the church even now. Well, he goes on to describe in chapter 3, verse 18, Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you thinks he is wise in this age, let him become foolish that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness before God. For it is written, He is the one who catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the reasonings of the wise that they are useless. Now, why is he saying this? Because there are believers there at Corinth who are actually, in their mind, they're judging Paul. Paul makes it very clear, he who is spiritual, onocrino, can critically examine and judge all things. That's onocrino. Yet he himself is critically examined and judged by no man. Now, just by way of reference there, he's referring to those at Corinth who are judging him. Can you imagine a church that actually believed in their mind that they had more spiritual wisdom and understanding than the Apostle Paul? And that's where they were, and they were deceived. They were just as deceived in their soul life as Peter was. And when he said, God forbid that you should go to the cross and die for our sins. He was completely sincere. And that's why in that passage in Matthew 16, he challenged us that we must pick up our cross, deny ourselves, and follow him. And that's before he who loses his soul life for my sake shall find it. He who gains it shall lose it. And so it's the soul life. It is that which represents who we are in Adam, in our natural thinking, in our emotions, that must go through many difficulties and trials, often, in order to allow God to bring about the practical co-crucifixion with Christ, in our experience, to release the Spirit. If there are those who have never read The Release of the Spirit by Watchman Nee, or the most recent book by Watchman Nee is titled Serve in Spirit, which is a follow-up to The Release of the Spirit. Another one by Watchman Nee is The Latent Power of the Soul. He goes into all of this and does a much better job than I'm doing today in really laying it out so that we can understand. Also, T. Austin Sparks' writing, I'm thinking in particular, What is Man? You go to austin-sparks.net and go into books. You select alphabetically under books and scroll down to what is man. That whole book was written to help us understand, to differentiate in terms of who we are and how God has made us between the function of the soul and the function of the spirit. All right, so he goes on to say, Let no one boast in men, verse 21 of chapter 3, For all things belong to you, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world, or life or things present or things to come. All things belong to you. You belong to Christ. Christ belongs to God. And so he brings in this whole issue of their alignment with different teachers, which was causing division there and preferring one over the other. And then there was the Christ party who said, we don't need any teachers at all. We just have Christ. In other words, they were just a law unto themselves. And they were just as much a problem as the others that were aligning themselves with Peter, Paul, and Apollo. And so what we have when we come to Corinthians is an amazing disclosure of that which represents the inability for Jesus to build his church. 
I mean, the church at Corinth, which obviously was founded by Christ to Paul in Acts 18, but the building process was corrupted. We see in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 to 17, that there were those that were not laying on the foundation of Christ gold, silver, and precious stones. They were building on the natural man, the wood, hand, stubble. That's not sin. Wood, hand, stubble is not sin. But they were bringing in that which was temporal versus the eternal. And therefore, Paul had to warn those that were teaching there at Corinth that if they are building on the foundation of Christ, wood, hay, and stubble, that which would characterize the natural man, that's not sin. Then there was going to be a huge bonfire at the judgment seat of Christ. In other words, it's all going to go in the fire. Because it's only that which comes from the Spirit and is governed by the Spirit and characterized by the Spirit that is going to survive the fire of the judgment seat of Christ. And so there were several innuendos through there. He didn't address directly their criticism of him, but now having address that which was the source of the divisions and some of the carnality and the basis of that carnality at the church in Corinth he now moves to a more personal reference in chapter 4 he says let a man regard us in this manner as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God in other words we are mature we are mature and we are stewards of God's mysteries and we know from chapter 2 verse 6 that he is indicating that as a mature believer that he was given this responsibility to share those truths but we know from 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verses 1 and 4 that they were not able to even receive them why? because chapter 2 verse 14 they're governed and characterized by the soul life their intellect is uncrucified 1 Corinthians 12 and 14 their emotions are uncrucified in other words the message of the cross had not touched practically those areas that would bring the sukikos, the soul governed man, under the dominion of the human spirit in union with the Holy Spirit. That work had not occurred in them. It had been retarded. And so naturally, when Paul was seeking to correct them, they were in opposition to him. And so that's what we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Let a man regard us in this manner as servants of Christ and as stewards of the mysteries of God. In this case, however, it is required of stewards that one must be found trustworthy. But to me, now here it is, but to me it is a very small thing that I should be examined by you. See the little word examined there, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3? Same word that we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. The word of praise, critically examined by you. He says he was spiritual, appraises all things, chapter 2, verse 14. But now he goes deeper, and now he's exposing their arrogance their arrogance, pride, as it comes out in 1 Corinthians 4, 6 and following. It is a very small thing, verse 3 of chapter 4, that I should be critically examined and judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even critically examine myself. Why? Because the Lord does that. I am conscious of nothing against myself, yet I am not by this acquitted, but the one who critically examines me, on a crino, same word, is the Lord. Therefore, notice what he's saying, to those at Corinth who had arrogantly set themselves up in a place higher than the Apostle Paul. That's 1 Corinthians 4, 6 and following. Complete arrogance. And no wonder there was division there. And you read all the way through. And not only was there other uh, issues, we have not only have the carnality of chapter 5 there of that man sleeping with his father's wife, but in chapter 6 we have believers taking believers to a law court that is not criminal law, but for civil disputes, property issues. And then we have issues they haven't separated from idolatry yet in chapters 8, 9, and 10. They still have not separated themselves from that which represents the eating things, sacrificed to idols, and participating in those activities that go on in pagan temples. And some of these pagan temples there at Corinth, there were a thousand cult prostitutes. And they would offer sacrifices, and they were being defiled by going there and participating in that, and even some of the other immoral things. To Corinthianize, that was a term used for the worst profligate in the ancient world. So there was a tremendous battle going on here for the saints at Corinth, and there's much more that could be spoken on that. But notice what he says in chapter 4, verse 5, Therefore do not go passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness, and disclose the motives of men's hearts, and each man's praise will come to him from God. That's the judgment seat of Christ that he just mentioned in chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. There's going to be a day when believers give an account for their life on earth to God, and especially in that context of ministry to other saints. And are we building on the foundation that which is eternal, gold, silver, and precious stones? So there's so much that could be spoken about this. But how do we move away? This is kind of a microscope now. How do we back away and look at this at a wide-angle view, if you will?
Jesus said, I'm going to build my church, and when that church reaches completion, in other words, when the church reaches the goal of Ephesians 4.13 Ephesians 4.15, that is, to a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. What characterized that church? The church will be filled into all the fullness of God, Ephesians 3.19. In Ephesians 4.15, it will represent a church that has grown up into Christ with reference to all things. And so there will be those who suffer loss throughout the church age, but there will be those that have paid the price, who have denied themselves, they have followed Christ, and allowed the work of the cross to progressively conform them into conformity with Christ in his death, Philippians 3.10, as we see in other passages where that event, where Christ is our representative, took us, who we are in Adam, with him to death on that cross, so that our life in Adam is terminated. That's positional. We allow the outworking of that, as we see in Romans 6, 1 through 12. We allow the outworking of that cross to have its practical outworking in our life. And so, when we look at the entire church age, God is monitoring everything in our lives individually, in every local church, and in the church and every generation, everything is measured according to how much has that individual, that local church, the believers in that generation, how far have they made their transition from Adam to Christ? Practically. If people want to pursue this more, I would recommend that they, again, go to austin-sparks.net and go into the book section. And under alphabetical, there's a book titled The Great Transition from One Humanity to Another. The another with a capital A referring to Christ. This is a whole study and meditation on this very issue from the book of Corinthians. And so, what is the answer? I think in the remaining time that we have, in 1 Corinthians, we see so much of that which represents the carnality of the church at Corinth and also the carnality of much of what we see in the churches today in the world, unfortunately. Not all of them, but we see this. What is the answer? Well, 1 Corinthians, we see that which is addressing the carnality and that which is governed by the natural man in the church. So what's God's answer? 2 Corinthians, we have presented to us a spiritual man. Who is a spiritual man? What does it mean for a person to be spiritual? And so when we go to 2 Corinthians, we have the most intimate presentation of a man in Christ. And when Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, I know a man in Christ. Well, in 2 Corinthians, we have the Holy Spirit's presentation of a man in Christ. And so when we look at the example of Paul and how he as a spiritual father is presenting his ministry and actually defending his ministry to those who are saying that he's not really truly an apostle, we see a spiritual man. And so we see that God has a strategy. In fact, when we begin with Second Corinthians chapter 1, we see that this particular individual, Paul, God had to deal with Paul in such a way to make him to be a spiritual man. Notice what it says in Second Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. We do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of our affliction which came to us in Asia. He was writing Corinthians, well, first Second Corinthians while he was in Ephesus. There was an affliction that came to us in Asia that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength so that we despaired even of our life. So we had the conflict that was going on while he was there at Ephesus for three years, and then he got the message that the situation and the circumstances at Corinth were pretty grave. And so he was very depressed. I mean, after spending 18 months and then getting word of some of the conditions and what was going on at Corinth, it was very demoralizing. He says that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength so that we despaired even of life. And I remember talking to this man of God. He says, Christians never get depressed. And I looked at that man. I said, yes, they do. He says, no, he was adamant. He was an older brother. I said, well, Paul was. No, he was not. And I said, the word of God says he was. He was cantankerous. So that we despaired even of life. Second Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. Now, is there something wrong with Paul? He is human in this passage. There's nothing wrong with his spiritual life, but God is dealing with him also in the natural man. In other words, there's that in Paul, which is still governed by the natural man, just like there was in Peter, only it's more refined here. And Paul did not know this, but there was still some hidden trust in himself. And so God had to bring Paul into circumstances where he despaired of life. Chapter 1, verse 9 of Second Corinthians, Indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves. God help me. We see in Second Corinthians chapter 12, he asked the Lord to remove the thorn in the flesh. He asked him three times, but the Lord had said, 
my grace is sufficient for you, and my power is perfected in your weakness, Paul. So he had to learn that it was through weakness, not sin, but his natural weakness, as his soul life was being dealt with by God, as he was being reduced, as he was decreasing, it was making a way for Christ to increase in his life. So he says, indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves. Apocrino, it means, God, deliver me, deliver me. I can't, I want out of this. I mean, I, I'm despairing of life. And God answers back, death. The sentence of death means God's answer back to Paul is death. Not physical death, but the death that you die daily. He says in 1 Corinthians 15, I die daily. Philippians 3, 8 through 10, being conformed to his death. That was his goal, to so decrease and be conformed to Christ's death in his natural man, so that in his inner man he would be conformed to the image of Christ in his resurrection. And the goal is to make that complete transition from the natural man to the spiritual man. That is God's strategy with every one of us, and that was God's strategy with Paul. And so he says we have the sense of death within ourselves in order that we should not trust in ourselves. Did not Peter trust in himself? Did God not have to break him? Well, the same thing with the Apostle Paul, that he had to learn not to trust in himself, but in God who raises the dead. That means Paul had to be raised from the dead many, many times to even go on in the fulfillment of his apostolic calling. He could not have gone on unless he would have come more progressively to know Christ in the power of his resurrection, Philippians 3.10. He said in verse 10, who delivered us from so great a death. This is in his experience, and will deliver us. He upon whom we have set our hope. So in this process of the inward working of the cross, the strategy of God is to bring into crucifixion all trust in ourselves, verse 9, and to make a way for that which is God and God alone is our only source of hope, verse 10. And he says, and he will yet deliver us. And he says, you also joining and helping us through your prayers, that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the favor or grace bestowed upon us through the prayers of many. So Paul is just demonstrating what he went through as an apostle. And what did he learn? What did Paul learn through this experience? Well, chapter 1, verses 3 through 7 is what he learned. When we read chapter 1, verses 3 through 7, we see that this is the lesson that he learned after being submitted to that so great of death, that sentence of death, that brought all self-trust and confidence into ground zero in his life. So the only trust in God who raises the dead out from that experience of so great of death, verses 8 and 9, what did he learn? Here's what came out of that suffering. Chapter 1, verse 3 of Second Corinthians. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. The word comfort is paraclesis, who comforts us in all of our affliction. Notice, comforts us in all of our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort paraclesis, those who are in any affliction and suffering with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. So through this experience, he entered into a ministry of comfort. We know the Holy Spirit is referred to as the parakletos, the comforter, the one who is our counselor, the one who is called in alongside to help us in our weaknesses. The Holy Spirit is referred to parakletos. Well, this is the same word, only it's paraclesis. It's the ministry of the Holy Spirit through Christians. So, to the degree that we have suffered will be the degree that we can participate in the ministry of the Holy Spirit as Paracletos in imparting Paraclesis comfort and counsel and a blessing to others. This is what came out of this. This is what made Paul a spiritual man. I mean, you can have a message that's doctrinally correct, and it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to impart comfort. You can have two people preaching the same message. The other, it'll be intellectual and doctrinal. The other person, when they stand up and speak, the paraclesis of Christ is coming through them. Why? Because they have suffered. And so God's strategy to bring you and me into that place of paraclesis of comfort, it will be suffering. He says, who comforts us, verse 4, in all of our afflictions, so that we may be able, we may have the strength to comfort those who are in any affliction, notice, with the comfort, the paraclesis, with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort, again, paraclesis, is abundant through Christ. But if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort. In other words, Paul is able to see that what he went through in this horrible ordeal mentioned in verses 8 through 10, he went through this that he might learn how to be a vessel of comfort to others. This is more than just preaching the word. 
This is the whole being, his whole presence being that which can minister comfort. For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, verse 5, so also is our comfort in abundance through Christ. But if we are afflicted, verse 6, it is for your comfort, again, paraclesis, and, and deliverance or salvation, we could put in there, and sanctification. Or if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which is effective, it is supernaturally operational, in the patient enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. And our hope for you is firmly grounded, knowing that as you are sharers of our suffering, as you go through the same things that I went through, so also you are sharers of our comfort. That is a tremendous testimony of the fruit that came out of the sufferings of Paul. Now, if we come to Second Corinthians chapter 4, we also see the contrast between the two covenants, the law that came through Moses and the ministry of the Spirit that comes through Christ, who is the antitype to Moses in the contrast between the two covenants there in Second Corinthians chapter 3. We see that Paul, in dealing with the conflicts and all that is going on there at Corinth, he then returns to that which is so tremendous when it comes to a man in Christ. What is God's answer and provision for a carnal state that we see in 1 Corinthians? A man in Christ in 2 Corinthians. One who is a spiritual man. And we see that as a spiritual man, we see that in contrast to the old covenant where when God gave that law, which condemned man for his sin through Moses, that in Christ we have the ministration of the Spirit, we have the ministration of righteousness. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, we see Paul describing the ministry of the new covenant is the light of the new creation. In the original physical creation, he says, light shall shine out of darkness, quoting Genesis. This is 2 Corinthians 4, and verse 6. God is the same one who is shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. So that's the new covenant. And so Paul is a spiritual man. He sets up a contrast between that which is in the physical creation, the earth was brought out of judgment, and now in the spiritual new creation, man is brought out of spiritual death by the ministry of that which represents the light of the knowledge of the glory of God shining in the face of Jesus Christ. And he says in Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. This treasure, the treasure, that, that is the light of the knowledge of the glory of God that shines in the face of Christ. Not the light of the knowledge of the glory of God that shines in the face of Moses as the lawgiver, that's a reflected glory. This glory is derived glory. It comes from within. The glory that's in the face of Jesus Christ is not reflected like it was in the face of Moses. It's derived. It comes from the inside out. And that's one of the major differences between the two covenants. So he says, we have this treasure, this reality of the new covenant ministration of the Spirit. We have this treasure in earth and vessels that this surpassing greatness of the power may be of God and not from ourselves. That's what he learned through sufferings. The surpassing greatness of the power may be of God, not through ourselves. This is true ministry. To the degree that the servant of God has suffered will be the degree that he will be able to minister comfort. He will be able to impart that which is the very life of Christ itself. He says, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not despairing. We are persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying about in our mortal body the dying of Jesus. Notice the dying of Jesus, that what? The light, the resurrection life of Jesus may be manifested in our body. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, that the life, the resurrection life of Jesus may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death, this death that we are experiencing, has a positive outworking. Death is supernaturally operated in us, in our ghetto. But through this suffering, life, the life of Christ, is being released and at work in you. And so what we see here in the life of the Apostle Paul is God's strategy of uniting a church that is in a carnal state. God needs to raise up spiritual men like Paul. When you study the life and ministry of the Apostle Paul in Second Corinthians, this is God's answer to a weakened and anemic state of the church in the West, is for God to raise up spiritual men. For those who can judge and discern all things, he who is spirits can judge and discern all things, who knows what it means to be a man in Christ, Second Corinthians 12, and proclaim the mysteries of God in such a way that people not only hear truth they never heard before, but there is a life that is working in them, Second Corinthians 4.12. Something is happening. I hear this person's words, but there's something happening on the inside that I've never experienced before. And that is the life that's being released to a servant who has suffered. 
And in verse 16, Therefore we do not lose heart, for though our outer man is decaying. The outer man is not just the physical, but it also includes the psuchikos, chapter 2, verse 14, 1 Corinthians. The natural man, of course, including our mortal body as well, but the whole natural man is decaying. Yet our inner man, that our new identity in Christ is the new creation, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, any man be in Christ. In Christ, they're a new creation. There's the inner man, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day for the momentary light affliction. And when you look at the catalog of afflictions that Paul went through in 2 Corinthians 11, they do not look like light afflictions. This man, when you read what he went through in 2 Corinthians 11, in his service to Christ, it was a tremendous cost. And yet he calls it light affliction? Why? Because he has seen such a Christ, such a vast fullness of Christ, that when he compares all that he's going through in his life and ministry in terms of suffering, he calls it a light affliction, which is working out. There's a process of working out for us an eternal heavy weight of glory far beyond all comparison. That glory that he saw was because he was a spiritual man. So in the midst of all that suffering, what carried him? His ability to see as a spiritual man the eternal heavy weight of glory which is far beyond all comparison. The Corinthians couldn't see this because they were carnal. And so what's God answered to a carnal church? A spiritual man. A messenger, Revelation 2 and 3, who embodies the features of Christ as seen in the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians. This is his answer. This is the answer to the Corinthians. Who did God send to the low and the pathetic spiritual state of the church at Corinth? He sent a man. He sent a man, but he sent a spiritual man. A man who was crucified. That the message of the cross was not just a message, but it was demonstrated, as we see in the first four chapters of 2 Corinthians. While we look not at the things that are seen, Paul says, but at the things which are not seen. You cannot see the things that are not seen unless you are spiritual. If your life is governed by the life of the soul, that's all you're looking at is the things that are seen. You can't see the things that are not seen. But a spiritual man, he says, we look at not at the things that are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, temporary. But the things which are not seen are eternal. He could see into eternity because he was a spiritual man. He had submitted to the work of the cross in his life. And he is a demonstration of the power of God and the resurrection life of Christ coming through him for Christ to build the church. And so we have those men in every generation as leaders, and the church has never advanced throughout history without spiritual leadership. This idea that there's no leadership is not what we see in the New Testament. Yes, there is to be corporate sharing and contribution when the assembly comes together, as we see in 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, but you also see that Paul wrote Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, you are to preach the word, 2 Timothy 4, 1, in season, out of season. There is to be that which represents the authoritative teaching of the word of God. We see the same thing in Titus chapter 3, I believe in verse 8, there is the teaching of the word of God, Titus chapter 2, verse 1. If that's not there, then the church is not going to be built up. There must be the messengers. In Revelation 2 and 3, the messengers are masculine they're in the singular and what we need in the church today is men crucified men who are the messengers of Christ they're not bringing their message they're bringing the message of Christ to the churches and so that is my prayer for me I know that the only way that Jesus can build a church where I am is the measure in which Christ is being released through me and through others that are in fellowship with him is good teaching necessary? Yes, but good teaching is not enough. There must be administration of the paraclesis, the comfort of Christ. There must be the release of the life of Christ, or Jesus can't build his church. Because the church must embody, as we saw in our first installment on what is the church, the church is nothing more or nothing less than the embodiment and the manifestation of Christ in and through each local assembly. So God help us. We need to ask the Lord, what do you need to do in my life so that I can become a spiritual man? I can become a spiritual woman rather than governed by my emotions and my intellect, which are fine as long as they're under the control and dominance of the human spirit and union with the Holy Spirit. But if it's out ahead and in a place of ascendancy, you have the same conditions that we see at Corinth and that explains much of the condition we see in the church today. So we will give this portion to the Lord and ask God to open our eyes to his truth in Jesus' name. 